Thanks so much. And so also thanks to the organizers for setting this up. Um, uh, it's super fun to get to come to Columbia and talk to all of you guys, but it's also super fun to get to come and talk with Rebecca and Josh. So it's a double, a double treat um, for us. It's also great to go after Rebecca, who so nicely set up the kind of thing I want to talk to you about today, which is the question of whether or not all those cool theory of mind abilities you just heard about are the kind of thing we can find in just one species on the planet, namely us, or whether we can see similar hints of those kinds of capacities in non-human animals. And so I'm going to take one part of the many theory of mind abilities that Rebecca talked about, I'm going to kind of review two different parts of it, in fact, and then we're going to explore whether or not primates have those parts. And you're going to come up with an answer. The, the preview spoiler answer is that they're going to have some of those parts, but not others. And then I'm going to ask the question, what are the consequences of the parts that we have, but they don't? What does this mean for us and for the human species? Rebecca kind of nicely started me out, so I don't have to give you the big overview of theory of mind, but of course every theory of mind has to start with uh, the humanities, jumping back to a crazy situation where our theory of minds are very active, namely making sense of the last scene of Romeo and Juliet. And the amazing thing about theory of mind, the thing that still strikes me and makes me want to study this question today, is that we don't view this scene in the way we're supposed to, right? We're not viewing the scene just in terms of the behaviors we're seeing and the actions that people are taking. We take this cognitively incredible step where we imbue those characters with mental states. We know that there are things going on inside Romeo's head, and this still fascinates me, because how on earth do we do this? I think it's just worth like reflecting on the fact that our minds are so crazy that we do this. But we do this, and the two parts of the things we're thinking about in Romeo's head that I want to focus on when we turn to non-human primates are two different kinds of states we could imbue Romeo as having. So one of the states that you imbue Romeo as having when you see this scene is what I'm going to talk about in this talk as awareness states. You know that Romeo knows stuff about the world that you know is true, right? And so you might think that Romeo has states of seeing. He can see uh, Juliet on the bed. He also knows other facts about the world. He knows that she's in the room. And you're good at imbuing him with these states, right? You're not getting this from his behavior. You're representing it as being part of his head. But in some ways, these are easy states to imbue for you. You just have to know the facts on the ground yourself and realize that Romeo knows the same stuff. So this is representing Romeo's awareness states. But you also do the second, more impressive thing, and this is the thing that Re Rebecca was talking about, your ability to represent other people's beliefs. And that I'm going to refer to as representing other people's representational states. The only way you could know this stuff is not just to kind of think the other person has access to the facts on the ground. You have to simulate a completely different world in this guy's head that's different from the world you yourself know to be true. And you do this, of course, by simulating that Romeo, in this case, has a different belief than you do. You've been watching the play. If you remember your Shakespeare, you know she's secretly alive, but he thinks that she's dead, right? And the only way you can make sense of this play is that you can hold these two representations at once, not get confused by them, and know whose is whose, right? So the capacity that we seem to have, we know a lot about its development, we know a lot about how it works neurally, but are we the only guys out there that have it? Is this the kind of thing that we can see in non-human animals as well? And I could have picked any old non-human animal because it would be just as good for answering the question about human uniqueness. Today I'm going to focus on the non-human animals that I hang out with a bunch, these guys here. Um, this is a primate species known as the rhesus macaque. Um, we're lucky enough to study these guys not in a laboratory but out at a field station. Um, this is the island of Cayo Santiago off the coast of Puerto Rico. Um, it's very easy to get undergraduates to come do studies with you because it looks quite nice. Um, but it's most relevant to us not because it's warm with palm trees. It's relevant because it has a thousand free-ranging rhesus macaques who are very, very habituated to human observers. And that means we can set up cognition studies right there out there in the field to test monkeys on studies very, very similar to the ones that we can do with human children. And I'll tell you about some of these, right? So with this setup, can we actually ask whether or not monkeys can represent these same states? Do they know that other people are aware of stuff? Do they know that other people represent stuff? And so to first tackle this awareness question, way back in the day, we did a bunch of studies that had the following idea. If monkeys know what other people are aware of, then they should use that information against people. Specifically, they should kind of avoid doing things when other guys are aware of it. 
And one of the things we know monkeys at this field site avoid doing is they don't like taking the food of people who are watching them because people tend to get upset when they do that. However, anecdotally, we also realized that all the time these monkeys were quite good at stealing the food of people who weren't aware of them because we would often um, recognize that our lunch had gotten taken away when we weren't paying attention. And so we decided to test this really specifically to ask, do the monkeys know when we're aware? Do they know when we can see something? In a setup much like this, we had two experimenters who are each um, standing in front of a little platform with a grape on it. Um, they then take a position where one of the experimenters is aware of what the monkey's gonna do, the other is unaware. And we just give the monkeys a minute to see what they do. Basically, we're asking, who does the monkey rip off? Who do, who, which grape do they steal? And what we find, um, you can just kind of see in this picture, is that the monkeys are pretty good at this. They seem to track who is aware of them coming. They can tell the difference between somebody who's facing forward and facing backward. They can tell the difference between somebody who's looking forward and looking away. They can even understand how simple visual barriers work. They're really good at tracking who's aware of what when they're doing these actions and when they're doing the stealing. But what about in the kinds of contexts that Rebecca talked about? Are the monkeys actually good at making predictions about what a person who knows something will do? As in the case of some of those kids when they're sort of tracking, you know, if the pirate knows where something is, he should search where that object is. Well, to test that, what we do with the primates is that we borrow a different sort of developmental psychology test, one that measures what the, what the subjects are predicting, not by asking them to sort of make a prediction verbally, but by measuring where those individuals look. And here's one of the ways um, that infant researchers have done this. They present human babies, an event, a little puppet stage event, kind of like the ones that Rebecca showed, in which this case is a person who's watching as an object moves from one location to another. So here's a spot where she is aware of this, she has a true belief about what's going on, and we can test whether or not babies have an expectation about what she'll do with that true belief by showing babies one of two different test events. Either after watching the object move from the dark box to the light box, the person reaches in that box as though she knew where it was and she reaches to the right spot, or she reaches to the unexpected box, she reaches to the wrong box as though she didn't know where it was. When you show 15-month-old babies events like this, babies will end up looking longer at this unexpected event as though they were in some sense surprised by the fact that she didn't act correctly given that she was aware of what's going on. And so we can steal this exact same technique to test our monkeys down at the field site. Here's kind of what it looks like when you're doing these looking studies with monkeys at the field. You have a person who's a presenter who's gonna be acting on the box. You have the monkey, of course, who's the subject. And right behind this presenter is a camera person who's filming how long the monkeys watch. And so we do this in real time. We kind of film the monkeys' reactions to these events. And then we can go home and analyze how long they watch and measure their duration of looking. And here's what we present monkeys with to ask if they know how April will act when she sees something. So monkeys watch April watch an object go into a box, and then she either reaches to the expected or unexpected location. And again, prediction is that when they see April reach the expected location, this should be super boring, and the monkey should, video should look like this, monkey's looking super bored. In contrast, when April reaches to the unexpected location, this should be shocking, we should get videos that look like, you know, this is not really what the videos look like, we're just measuring subtle differences in duration. Um, but when you do that, if you're kind of plotting how long the monkeys watch, they tend to watch almost twice as long for these unexpected events, as though they're detecting she is aware of where it is, she should reach accordingly. And so this and a host of other studies that in my short time I don't have a chance to tell you about suggest that monkeys and other primates are pretty good at representing when other individuals are aware. So you can kind of tick that one off. The controversy comes when we look at whether or not other primates are good at representing whether or not others are good at representing stuff. Can they do something like solve a false belief task? And the good news is we, again, have a way to test this. We can use this looking measure to try to get at whether or not the monkeys will make the same correct prediction if in the case of a person who doesn't just have a true belief about what's going on, but a case where somebody has a false belief. And here's how we were able to operationalize that. Monkeys see an event in which April's watching this object go into one box. It's gone into the green box, but now when she's not looking, the monkeys get privileged access to now it's in the white. And so the question is, what do they predict? 15-month-old babies, incidentally, when tested on this task, actually make the correct prediction. They seem to represent that the person will act on the basis of her false belief. And so we thought, given that 15-month-old babies are pretty good at this, maybe this would be a task the monkeys could succeed on as well. And so here are just the data you saw before in that other condition where the person had a true belief, the monkeys were pretty good at this, and this is what we see in the case of the false belief. And this was one of those studies where you're about to hit go on the data and you're like, it's gonna be one pattern or another. And this was a pattern we found somewhat surprising. And so in my lab, when we see surprising data, you make the surprise monkey data phase. You go, oh, what's going on? 
And why is it surprising to us? Well, we assumed one of two things were going to happen on this condition. We either thought, well, the monkeys will be able to represent false beliefs, in which case this unexpected effect, that bar is going to be really big because they'll find that surprising. That was kind of hypothesis one. Hypothesis two was like, maybe the monkeys don't understand false beliefs. Maybe they think April will reach where the object really is. In which case, we expected kind of the other pattern of behavior. We said, well, maybe this blue bar would be super high here. What we found, though, is that monkeys thought both of those cases were kind of boring. And what we realized is that this is telling us something about something important about how the monkeys are representing this case. They seem to realize that April doesn't know where the object is, that she's in some sense unaware, but they don't make a correct positive prediction about what she's gonna do. It's as though, well, she doesn't know where it is, so she could reach anywhere, you know, she doesn't know. And so this is an interesting pattern of data that we saw in the monkeys, but it's turned out that lots of other studies are kind of corroborating this pattern, suggesting that other primates might not be representing the kinds of beliefs that other individuals have. And before I wrote this talk, about a week ago, this slide didn't have this new data point that some of you might have seen in the news, kind of suggesting that um, one set of primates, the apes, might actually have some hints of this stuff. Um, and so if you're deeply in the know about this, I'd be happy to talk afterwards. But I have reason to suspect that even this one should be in this list here, suggesting that we're not seeing evidence of this stuff. So hold that to the questions later. But the upshot is that most of the data today in non-human primates suggests if we were to give them a fantastic Shakespearean play in which involved representing other people's representations, they just wouldn't get it. They wouldn't be able to do the amazing thing that we're able to do, which is to track that another person, another agent's beliefs or their own representations might differ from our own representations of the world. This might be a fundamentally different ability that we have that other species don't have. I want to end the talk, though, with the question about what are the consequences of this? Now imagine it, for the first time we, up to about like in the last five million years or so, since our common ancestor with chimpanzees, have developed a new ability to track multiple representations at once. And this leads to a bit of a cost. It leads to a cognitive problem, which is that we have to be very good at keeping these representations separate. Right? When we're viewing a scene like this, we have these two representations that are turned on, one for Romeo, one for us, and we have to kind of keep them so that they don't interfere with one another. We have to keep them separate. And if I'm right that this ability is a new one in our evolutionary history, it's kind of just in beta version. Like it's kind of just this new app that hasn't gotten tested very well. And if that's right, we should be able to see glitches in the way that we do this spots where we can't actually do it as well as we think, that there's a consequence to holding these representations at once, a consequence that we face that other species simply don't. And that's what we've been looking at more recently. What are the costs of holding these kinds of things at the same time? And we, I'm going to talk about two potential costs that I see as quite relevant. Um, one is a phenomenon that we see in humans, which is known as altercentric interference, basically a fancy word for the fact that other people's representations sometimes mess you up. And so here's the task I'll put you in if you were in an ultracentric interference experiment. I'd have you do a task where your task is to tell me how many red dots are on the screen. Okay, and it's fun if you play along, right? Just, you might see other stuff on the screen, ignore that, just tell me how many red dots. Okay, good. Um, you guys are pretty good at this. Um, you might be wondering why there was a guy on the screen, of course. That's because I'm a tricky cognitive psychologist and he's what I'm really measuring. I know you're pretty good at detecting different numbers, but I want to see if your representation of his representation is messing you up. And you might have noticed that there were cases that kind of varied like that, some where he had the same representation as you and some where he didn't. And if you do this kind of thing more carefully than I'm doing with reaction time in a room like this, and actually measure how quickly you respond and how many errors you make, what folks like Ian Apperley and his colleagues have found is that subjects will be slightly faster and more accurate when that avatar on the screen has the same representation as you do. Um, the flip side of that is that when you're representing this person's perspective as different from your own, when the number that he sees is different from yours, you seem to have a problem with it. It kind of messes you up. So I take this as some evidence that other people's representations might be interfering with ours. So is this the kind of thing we see in non-human animals too? Well, I teamed up with two fantastic graduate students, Alia Martin and Lindsay Drayton, to test this. And what we did was a kind of monkey version of that same study. So imagine our little April setup of little boxes there, and we're just showing April looking at different objects in a setup that looks like this. And here was how we presented it to them. We habituate them to a case where the monkeys themselves are seeing two objects, but April, the person in the scene, can only see one. They see that several times in a row, 
and then we test them on different test conditions that always vary a little bit. And the question that, that of interest is whether April's representation has changed, the avatar in the screen, and whether the monkey's representation has changed, whether the number of the monkey seen has changed. And so just to operationalize this, some monkeys get a very boring change where the objects just move. The monkey's own perspective is the same. He saw two before, he still sees two. And the same is true for April. She saw one before, she's still seeing one. We then can do tasks where the monkey's perspective changes. So he was seeing two before, but now he only sees one, but the person's perspective is still the same. Or the case where the monkey's perspective is the same, he's still seeing two, but now the person's view has changed, and then one where we do them all together. And the two questions here are, has the monkey changed, is the monkey surprised when his number changed? It should, if our task is working. And is he further surprised when the person's representation has changed, right? And so we can look at these data, and what we find is a robust, if you're watching how long the person's looking here, what we see is a robust effect when the monkey's perspective changed. When he's looking at two and now it switches to one, he finds that very surprising, but he's not showing any effect on behalf of the person. It seems like the other person's representation is not messing up his own. And so it suggests that something like alter-centric interference might also be the purview of our species alone. Other species aren't representing other people's content, and therefore they're not having the kind of costs associated with that. But a final cost, I think, might be very, very relevant to the fact that we alone are representing other people's representations, is the fact that, is that we are susceptible to other people's bad representations. We're susceptible to other people's bad ideas, maybe in a way that no other non-human animal is. And for this, I'll end with a neat phenomena that developmental psychologists have been very interested in, which is what's known as over-imitation, sort of imitating too much. But here's the problem. You are either a chimpanzee subject or a young child subject, and you're faced with a very tricky puzzle box that you don't know how to open. Um, if I were to ask you how to open this, you might not know. You might like mess around with this thing up here, or maybe try to mess around with the door. Luckily, you would be in a condition where somebody was able to help you. Somebody was going to show you how the box worked. And here's Vicki Horner. This is the scientist who did this study and showing the chimpanzee subject in this case how the box works. You can see she's uh, poking the stick at the top. I guess you have to move those sticks out of the way. Then you can poke at the top. And then once you do that, you can open it. And the first question Vicky had was whether or not chimpanzees could copy, whether they could imitate when they needed to kind of follow what Vicky was up to. And what you're seeing here is that the chimpanzees are pretty good at this. They kind of slavishly copy her moving those sticks out of the way, then they use the stick in the top, and then after that they can open the front box. So pretty good at that. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, when you do the same thing with human children, human children are also pretty good at this. Um, you can see what, what they do after having witnessed the same action. Um, kind of doing this sort of thing and then opening up the door to get a treat. And so all of that makes a lot of sense if you don't know how to open the box. So it seems totally reasonable if you see somebody do this, you're like, yeah, I don't know how this box works, makes sense. But what if you didn't need somebody else's representation of the problem to help you? What if you could figure it out on your own? For example, what if the box was transparent and you could see that in the box was nothing, it was just air and kind of a false top, the only relevant thing in the box is this door. You probably wouldn't need much help in this case, you could just solve it by opening the door. But what if you had help, help of somebody who was representing the problem in a pretty dumb way? What if somebody came and used the stick to kind of stick into the air, but you could see it wasn't really doing anything? This wouldn't mess up your own representation of how to solve the problem, or would it? That's the question that Vicky asked, um, and since it's her study, I'll try to make sure the audio is on so that she can tell you what she found. The second box that I showed the chimpanzees is this one, and it's identical to the opaque box, except that it's made out of material which is see-through. Only now is it obvious that the tapping and poking don't achieve a thing. The box has a full ceiling. And so the first question is whether or not the chimpanzees are going to fall for it, right? They're smart species who can figure this out on their own, and they're maybe not as susceptible to other people's bad ideas. So let's see what chimpanzees do. The chimps cut to the chase. They skip the needless steps. For the apes, it is all about the treat. It makes sense, natural selection, not going to develop these dumb species who don't have dumb things. The sad thing, though, is what happens to us. Um, our you know, human children of four years of age could easily figure out this box without help. Um, does the other person's bad solution mess them up? You're all laughing, which means you're good cognitive scientists with good intuitions about the data, um, but here's what happens in kids. Kids in this particular study. There he is. You got him now. 
And so I think that this phenomena that we're very, very susceptible to other people's bad ideas might be a consequence of the nice thing about our mind, which is very good at, we're very good at representing other people's ideas. Um, and what I want to summarize is that we alone might be able to do this amazing thing, which is to simulate content that's a completely different possible world than the one we're in right now. We can imbue somebody else's head with that. We can also think about content like future states, all kinds of other contents. But the problem is that this leads to a cost. We have to keep these contents separate. And there might be some interesting signatures of what, what happens when this process goes awry. And so with that, I will end. This is my thank you slide, because I get to be this monkey who comes to New York to this fun spot and talk to you. Here are all my students who are back in New Haven working very hard. Um, and you saw many of them, but here are these folks again. Thanks so much.